going. Let me just turn this on. Oh, better. Um, Jesus. Ooh. Okay. It's my monkey mask. Um, I used it in a performance a while back. It's sort of scary, actually. This is Dr. Jason Munsell. It is Sunday morning, and I'm just sort of monkeying around. Um, it's about 11.15 or so Sunday morning. Um, and I'm um, sorry I didn't get to this sooner. I've been sort of under the weather um, and, and et cetera. Um, and uh, I know your uh, first papers are rolling in um, this morning, and I will try to get to them as soon as I can. Um, but I've got lots of things coming in from multiple classes, so uh, I cannot promise you that I'll have everything done by uh, our class on Tuesday. Um, but I will give it the old college try. Uh, what I'm going to do here is give the old college professor a try and try to very quickly get through Chapter 5. If you've looked at the schedule, we've got a pretty quick turnaround um, when it comes to... Oops, I have to set this camera up right. Uh, when it comes to the uh, the next paper, the mini paper two, and so mini paper two, as you know from the syllabus and everything like that, uh, and the assignment is going to be generally the same, um, is taking the lessons from chapter five on managing crisis uncertainty uh, to one of the case studies in chapter six. So, you know, second verse, same as the first. Um, what I'm going to try to do very, very quickly is go through uh, the lessons in Chapter 5, and then that's what we're going to discuss uh, and, and play with a little bit and apply uh, when we uh, see each other face-to-face -face on Tuesday. Um, so, and then a question mark. Ah, uncertainty. Should I be giving this lecture? Ah. Yeah, probably. I have to contact that one. But in any case, okay, so we had the big sort of just Chapter 3 was just effective crisis communication lessons generally. Uh, this goes through the notion of uncertainty. Um, and what they say, and remember that uncertainty was a, a huge part of the definition of, of, of a crisis uh, anyway. We don't know what's going on. Um, but uh, there's lots of little things in here. Uh, the preface here, you can't see that, can you? Eh, I'm sorry. Um, I should do white letters on back, black. Or dark backgrounds. Uh, but in any case, um, I will put this PowerPoint on KC, obviously. Um, the preface is uh, that we got uh, the first four lessons are uh, about uncertainty um, and the challenges that uncertainty offers us as practitioners of crisis communication and, uh, and, and scholars, etc. And then the next six are about uh, changing uncertainty into opportunity. So obviously infused into all of this stuff uh, is still their discourse of opportunity uh, or discourse of renewal, I should say. Um, so uh, what they do first is they define uncertainty, which I thought was uh, some pretty cool things uh, here. They have uh, some more in-depth information than they have offered in other aspects of the book. I totally screwed up. This, this camera should be farther away and I can't get much farther away or I'll be away from the, uh, um, the, the desk here. Uh, in any case, um, uh, they uh, talked about uh, crisis-induced certainty. So they, obviously, they, they define uncertainty generally, I think. I don't know. I'm uncertain. Uh, uncertainty is the inability to determine the present or predict the future. Oh, really? I did not realize that. Uh, but then they talk about how crisis-induced uncertainty is quite different from the type of uncertainty people and organizations experience on a daily basis. What should I have for lunch? I am uncertain. That is not crisis-induced uncertainty. Uh, to better understand the scope of crisis uncertainty, we illustrate the role through our definition of crisis, blah, 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 blah. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, really, the, the important stuff here is from... A, Talib, I think you pronounce it, um, explains that crisis often creates uh, epistemological and ontological uncertainty. So those are the two things that you really need to remember about uh, crisis-induced uncertainty and how our authors are trying to define that. Um, epistemological uncertainty is the lack of knowledge we have following a crisis. Epistemology is generally about knowledge and how we know what we know 
And so epistemological uncertainty is just basically, we don't have the knowledge to know. We don't know what's going on. We don't have that knowledge. Uh, what happened? Uh, I don't know. Uh, did something blow up? Yeah. Why? I don't know. Um, how, how big is the threat? I don't know. Um, but in any case, so, so, you know, the lack of knowledge. And then ontology usually is about the notion of our very uh, being. Um, but but well, let me say a little bit more about epistemological uncertainty. Uh, basically, they say because crisis events are so new, complex, and subject to change, there's often little knowledge available about how to manage them. For this reason, crisis often creates gaps in knowledge for extended periods of time that constrain decision-making and understanding. Yeah, makes sense. And then the ontological that's usually about uh, meaning. Uh, what this basically says is, is that it refers to the type of uncertainty in which the future has little or no relationship to the past. Basically, the notion of who we are is, is new. We don't know. We, we have lost our way. We do not know who we are. And so crisis events are often described as creating a new normal, a new organization, a new how we see ourselves, a new sense of being. Um, so this new normal is highly uncertain because people's beliefs about how the world operates change dramatically. And they talk about how you know, life post 9-11 uh, versus pre 9-11 and all the different stuff, uh, considering the JJJ airport security as an example. So when they're defining uncertainty, the, the big thing to think about here is that epistemological, we don't know. We don't have the knowledge to know what's really going on. And then the ontological is, is that we become, in a sense, a, a new organization, and we don't know what the hell we're doing yet. But we'll figure it out. Um, so that's uncertainty, as they define it. And then they talk about unexpected uh, crises and uncertainty. That's the next little section here on page 91, moving on to page 92. Um, and, you know, basically they have the Malta Mills example. Um, and the lesson one here is organization members must accept that a crisis can start quickly and unexpectedly. Yeah. So that's the definition. So we just need to realize that, yeah. We can have a crisis. We'll start fast, and we won't foresee it necessarily. Okay. So that's the first lesson. And then uh, the next section talks about non-routine crises, events, and uncertainty. Um, and you know, crises are dramatic and chaotic. And um, one thing I thought was pretty interesting when I was looking back through this, obviously they give uh, Exxon um, uh, Valdez and all that stuff and how Exxon did all this. as, as um, you know, They did it badly. Um, but basically, uh, we have to respond with uh, a unique solution. We can't just use the same old solutions. So um, uh, organizational leaders, this is just the first part of that section, uh, have several options when responding to a crisis. They can respond with routine procedures, such as firing the person responsible for the crisis, minimizing the scope of the crisis, or shifting the blame. Alternatively, they can respond with unique solutions that directly rectify the crisis. Although routine solutions can be effective, they rarely rectify systematic problems in the organization. So, lesson number two. Organizations should not respond to crises with routine solutions. You got to have novel solutions. So number one, crises can start quickly. We don't expect them. Lesson number two, when we try to respond to the crises, we need to have novel solutions, not routine solutions. Where do those solutions come from? I am uncertain. Threat perception and uncertainty is the next section. Um, and this is, you know, we don't always know uh, how, know the real threat or how big the threat actually is to all the people, to, to uh, the birds, the, the environment, uh, the, uh, uh, the organization, all our stakeholders, etc., etc., etc. And so basically, uh, and this goes back to framing as well, but we, everything is a perception, right? I mean, obviously there are facts and everything like that, but we even perceive facts. I mean, it's just, or we filter it through, through the way we see the world. Um, so basically, uh, threat and uncertainty are linked because there is doubt about whether organizational goals will be met as a result of the crisis, blah, blah, blah. 
there is uncertainty about the level of the threat the organization is experiencing. Uh, so basically, this is the big thing here. The fact that threat is perceptual contributes to the overall uncertainty of the event. Um, some people in an organization may view a situation as a potential crisis, others not so much. And then they give the computer code problem, the Y2K. I don't know if you remember Y2K um, during uh, when we were moving from, from Prince, when we were all listening to Prince. How does that go? Boom, party lights, 1999. Boom, 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 I went to bed at 8 because I was scared of Y2K. What happened? Not much. So they talk about how a lot of folks didn't take this seriously. Um, that was their perception. It's not that big of a deal. And that perception ended up to be pretty good because well, it wasn't that big of a deal. So threat basically is perceptual. Um, that is, we perceive how big the threat's going to be, and that impacts the whole uncertainty about everything. Um, and then I think the more specific lesson, though they don't actually put it in here, is that uh, we have to communicate about the threat potential, because we know we don't know. So it's all what I would you know be conservative and say you know um, it's all it's it's never over reassure. Right? So that's important. Um, but threat is perceptual. Then they move on to short response time. Yeah. So they talk about, you know, basically we can't stonewall even though, um, you know, we won't have all the answers and we need to very quickly. Uh, some, uh, I've read some research that would say immediately uh, try to respond. Um, but I do like uh, that they give us uh, potential questions that all the stakeholders, um, our, you know, our customers, our employees, all you know, in the media, uh, the folks, who, they're going to want to know what happened, who's responsible, why did it happen, who's affected, what should we do, who can we trust, uh, what should we say, how should we say it, blah, 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 blah. Um, so, and, and they, you know, they say you should be prepared to answer these questions, but going back to you know all the stuff, not not always are we going to have uh, obviously prepared answers. We just need to be prepared to answer, if that makes any sense. Um, and I think the stuff on page ninety four is really really good, um, good advice here before they get to this lesson number four. Crisis communicators must be able to have a clear and consistent message and present this message quickly and regularly following a crisis event. If the organization is not prepared to provide definitive answers and explanations related to crisis, the spokesperson must be able to provide information, such as the organization's latest safety records, its measures for collecting information about the crisis, and a timeline for how it is going to handle the crisis. Good advice for crisis communicators to tell people what you know, what you do not know, and what you are going to do to find answers to the still unanswered questions about the crisis. That's smart. So don't stonewall, don't lie, don't give absolute answers, don't over reassure, but you need to respond quickly. So lesson four uh, is basically uh, crisis communicators must communicate early and often following a crisis regardless of whether they have critical information about the crisis. And of course, how early is early? The book doesn't say there is, I mean, it's always contextual. As I said, sometimes it's immediate. If there's an immediate danger to your stakeholders, uh, obviously if you find out that, you know, your burrito is tainted, um, you know, we can't have a tainted, or, or if we realize or hear that there are wild monkeys loose in Colombia. <laughs> Finnegan just looked over here. Um, then we need to get the word out pretty quickly about those wild monkeys because they're going to get you. Um, so, but it's also contextual, right? So, you know, but the idea is earlier the better. Don't wait, don't be Domino's Pizza. Um, they waited too long to get onto YouTube, etc., etc., etc. Earlier the better. Okay. Uh,